thank you everybody and good afternoon. Like, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, so my name is Jim Min and I'm joined here by Jerome Bax and we're here to tell you sort of a 15 year old story, like a, a story that's been 15 years in development. And that's when uh, Jerome and I first met and we came across a, uh, actually I didn't, but Jerome came across a patient um, in 2006 that he had questions about. It was somebody who presented very atypically. And it turns out that that one patient um, um, caused him to ask a series of questions that really opened up an entire body of research in the non-invasive imaging field. And so over the course of the last 15 years, we've seen the strength of um, a strengthening of our collaboration uh, between Drones Lab and, and ours. And then we've seen, um, even more importantly, the strengthening of a friendship um, that continues to grow. And so I'm going to turn the, the talk over to him right now. And we've divided this up into two sections. I think what Jerome will start with is really how the patient really forces us to ask the most important questions and to talk about his research around uh, to try to answer that question. And then we're going to talk about a bridge um, and where he'll hand it off to me. I'll talk a little bit about our former research and what we learned and then how we can effectively translate all of that research into clinical care. So hopefully by the end of this 15 minutes, um, you'll walk away with this understanding that really it was the patient that drove a question, the question that drove the research, and then how do you create that in a way that you can translate it to daily clinical care. So, um, Jerome, it's a pleasure to be here next to you, and I'll hand the baton off to you. Well, Jim, that's nice to see each other here at a scientific session where it all started. I remember that scientific session where we met each other. And um, yeah, why is atherosclerosis so important? Because it's the fundament of all coronary heart disease, basically. And it's something that, that comes for a lot of patients, but it's also a modifiable risk factor. And that's what we're going to talk about. And through atherosclerosis, we learned that this is really all that matters. Coronary artery disease versus the presentation is what this displays here. So it starts with coronary atherosclerosis. And as you see on that left panel, that results in coronary narrowing, and that results in transient ischemia combined with angina. And that's the story of the severity of coronary artery disease. That's the story of the percentage stenosis. That's the story of the PCI related to an 80% narrowing in a patient with chronic chest pain. If we talk about that, there are ways now to do this non-invasively, to assess non-invasively what's happening in somebody's coronary arteries. And actually, this is the story of atherosclerosis. If we talk about atherosclerosis in the coronary arteries, there are a couple of things that we need to think about. The extent of the plaques, the location of the plaques, the plaque severity, and last but not least, the plaque constitution. Atherosclerosis, let's focus on that first part, the stable chronic coronary artery disease. There we're going to talk about plaque extent, the plaque location, and the plaque severity. This is actually this one, two, three in these four pictures. You see here, very clear, I'm going to take the pointer to show it even better to you. Here we see the plaque extent, also the location very proximal versus very distal. And this one here in the middle, this talks about extent but also severity because you see it's non-obstructive this one there's a lot lumen left and here you see that it's also very diffuse in this coronary arteries and here you see an artery where there's only one small calcium spot so coronary disease relates to plaque location plaque extent and severity and it comes in all sorts of sizes but the other part of that is this plaque constitution and jim talked about this one one patient that for me changed my whole way of thinking. We're going to get there in a second. If we talk about plaque constitution, this is what we always used to look at. We used to think about different plaques. We got non-calcified plaques. We got mixed plaque where we see non-calcified lesions and very calcified lesions. And then we got the completely calcified lesions. This is the story of stable coronary artery disease. Non-calcified like this, we see very, very little. 2% in the population that we described. Mixed, as I told you, non-calcified versus calcified, also not that often in stable coronary disease, not even 10%. It's almost all this, how the patient present in stable coronary disease. Almost 90% present with total calcified lesions. Let's switch now. Let's talk about this other side of the coin. This is the story about vulnerable plaque. This is the story about myocardial infarction and sudden cardiac death. This is the story about vulnerability, vulnerable plaques in vulnerable patients. 
If you look at this CT scan and you look at that coronary artery, then you realize that atherosclerosis is a diffuse disease. And among all these lesions that you see here, and they come in all sorts of variations, we ask ourselves the question, which of these lesions may eventually cause a myocardial infarction? And that's what's stated here, the search for vulnerability of lesions in the coronary arteries. This is the second part of that paper that we published in Acute Cardiac Care Journal in 2007. This is the second part when we did CT scans in patients presenting not with an acute coronary syndrome, but a sort of in-between presentation. Patients presented at the chest pain unit and they didn't have a completely abnormal ECG. They didn't have a completely elevated troponin, but these were these ones where the story is something what you think, this is something going on with that patient. It is not completely rule out and it's also not rule in, but it's just these patients, they ask you questions like, what's going on with them? So we did CT scans in those patients because we had the CT scan operating during uh, working hours as a first line of assessment. And you see here, non-calcified lesions were present in about 20%. Mixed lesions were present in 36% and calcified in the remaining 50%. So what does this tell us? It is here where the difference is. This is where we see that about 50% of patients presenting, not with a complete a ACS, but presenting with, an, with a feeling that it is not, it's not okay with this patient. 50% of the patients present like that. And we're going to now talk back about this plaque constitution in unstable patients. And this is this paper that we published in 2008 with Maureen Hanneman about non-invasive evaluation with multi-slice CT in suspected acute coronary syndromes, where we focused on plaque morphology on multi-slice CT versus coronary calcium score. Plaque morphology versus co coronary calcium score. I'm going to give you this example that really changed my way of thinking about things. This is a man, 45 years old, no cardiac history, presents at the emergency room with acute chest pain. It looks like typical chest pain. Risk factors for coronary disease, he has hypertension, positive family history. When I look at the laboratory and the ECG, the ECG is typically what we discussed in the introduction. No ST elevation, no Q waves, but the troponin is not uh, diagnostically elevated, but it's in the middle. So the question is, does this patient have an ACS now? According to the definitions, no. This is his calcium score. Absolutely nothing. Calcium score zero. So does this patient have no coronary disease? Does he have non-significant coronary artery disease? This is when I saw the LAD of that patient. And you see that there is absolutely no calcium in that LAD, but there is a lesion here, probably less than 50%, totally non-calcified. This is even more striking. This is his right coronary artery, and you see this lesion here, totally non-calcified, more than 70%. The patient afterwards went to the cat lab, and it fitted completely completely what we saw on the CT scan, non-calcified lesions, and probably a patient presenting in a very early stage of an acute coronary syndrome. We looked at more of these patients. Here is a 59-year-old man with rapid developing chest pain, and he has a calcium score of zero. And you see here, again, completely non-calcified lesion, proximal in the coronary artery. And here's another one. This is a 50-year-old man presenting to the emergency room, no evident ECG changes, and the enzymes are again borderline. And this is what the CT scans showed. And you see that coronary artery here is a completely non-calcified lesion. And here is a lesion which is largely non-calcified, but there's also not completely spotty calcifications, a little bit more than that. But the focus is really non-calcified lesions in an early stage presenting with acute chest pain. That means something. And this is the last step in the research that we did over those years. Actually, what we did is we compared the CT scans in those patients and we took them to the cat lab. And you see here another example, spotty calcification, and there's a big non-calcified lesion right next to it. And we did an invasive angiogram. And you see here also the IVUS with virtual histology. And that red relates to these areas here. This is actually all necrotic core according to the IVUS virtual histology. So now we came full circle because we started with looking with the non-calcified lesions and we confirmed with the invasive angiography plus IVUS and virtual histology that these are actually the areas of acute inflammation representing vulnerable lesions. I'm going to stop here. This was the simple beginning, so to say, 
but um, this is where it all started. And that took, um, when I met with Jim, I explained him about the things we were doing and the observations we had, and he took that further. He went from there to this extent developments on how to further implement and bring the CT to the individual patients. This is an example of uh, true translational uh, medicine, right? Where it started with an observation from a single patient and over 14 years of research, it now becomes um, capable to be in the hands of uh, clinicians and patients to use it. Because I think it is, it is a true, it's a great example of translational medicine, right? That's what we, that's why we're doing what we're doing for so many years. So, what do you think of that as an idea, Jerome? Well, Jim, spot on. And uh, it has been actually, indeed, as you said, almost 15 years that we've been working together. And it started actually with us meeting, but then it grew in a true collaborative atmosphere because actually we have this PhD system in the Netherlands, in my university in Leiden, in the Netherlands. And um, there we take young, interested uh, uh, fellows through a whole pathway of learning, understanding science, writing their own articles, eventually in developing complete PhD. So when I visited you, Jim, I saw that you had a couple of international people among your army, I would say, of researchers. And uh, some of them came from Europe and I thought, well, that's kind of an opportunity for us to work together. What about if I give you some of my best researchers because I didn't want to come with, with I really wanted to send you the best. So we sent you a few. And and they worked with you and they did their own projects. And I remember at some stage, I used to come also regularly to New York. We sit down together and we talk about all sorts of observations we did, new hypotheses being generated through scientific atmosphere. And that, that whole thing, that brought us more and more together. And then eventually, the last fellow that I sent to you was actually my own son. And he spent with you also. He was very young, actually. He was the youngest of all that I sent. He was only 21 years old. And um, he did a little bit of research, and then you matured him in about one and a half year together with Leslie Shaw. And he did a full PhD because all the articles that he has um, um, published, but also a couple in, uh, in press at the moment, all this is good enough for an official PhD thing in the university where I am. You will be the guest of honor Jim, when we're going to have that ceremony. It was a great experience, and I think it's something that we're going to take to the next level again in the next collaborations that we're going to do for the next 14 years, I would say. <laughs> we met in 2007, and we discussed like some of the research that we um, did related to cardiac CT. And then Jerome, yeah. actually, he went the right way and started studying atherosclerosis, and I went the wrong way, trying to compare and <laughs> prove that a stenosis on a CT equals a stenosis on a invasive angiogram. And then we really hooked up in the early 2010s where we started to collaborate together. And let's um, we wanted to share with you some of that science and how we could effectively translate that into clinical care. I, I just wanted to take a moment and thank Jerome for his work because it really was that, that sort of realization about 14, now 14 years ago, when everybody in the field of CT angiography was so focused on stenosis severity and what, whether it could replicate a cath or not. And there was Jerome sort of thinking outside of the box and saying, wait a second, the primary disease process is not a stenosis, nor is it an ischemia. The, those are consequences of the primary disease, which is the atherosclerosis that sits within the wall of the vessel. And, you know, I only have a few minutes with you guys, so I'm actually going to try to summarize everything I know about atherosclerosis in a single slide. Um, so here is um, the last 15 years worth of work. And so, you know, Jerome and I have been friends and collaborators for many years now. Um, he sent um, a couple of fellows to our lab, and they really were pivotal in sort of advancing our understanding of coronary atherosclerosis. And I think what we realized is that atherosclerosis is not a single disease, um, nor should it be considered at a single point in time. Um, so what you see here is obviously a straightened multiplanar reformat from a coronary CT angiogram of a single artery that's cut into cross section. And those arteries are color coded on top and they're left grayscale on the bottom. And then um, using a, a, a software, we sort of manually um, circled these yellow and these orange circles, uh, which represents the lumen and the outer wall of the vessel. And then obviously everything in between that is plaque. And I think what you can appreciate is that not all plaques are built the same, right? These are very, very dark and low density, low attenuation. These are gray and lighter, and then they become brighter and wider until they become very, very bright white. 
And based on a study that was published by Sadako Moriyama and Jagat Narula, I think now almost more, more than 10 years ago, what they identified was that it was this type of plaque, this non-calcified low density plaque that really represented the high risk. And that was then furthered in a number of large scale clinical trials, including Iconic, um, Promise, a Scott Heart, where these plaques were really the strongest discriminants of future heart attack risk and major adverse cardiovascular events. But through Jerome's fellows, what we also identified was that these types of plaques also connote very different types of risk, including being rapid progressors of disease. So these plaques progress more rapidly, say, than these plaques. And then medication non-responders. So you can start somebody on an initial statin medication and see that maybe these don't respond as well. And then in a study that was published in JAMA Cardiology about a year ago, um, in the Credence trial, we also found that it was really these types of plaques that connoted ischemic vessels. And so one, one realization that came about from Alexander and Van Rosendahl, who came from Jerome's lab, was he said, well, if we are calling this relative risk, that these are the ones that are higher risk, then maybe the opposite end of the spectrum, these over here, these very bright plaques, maybe they're lower risk. And so what he did was he classified not um, plaques as calcified versus non-calcified. He classified it as a continuum of grayscale and said, maybe when you get to this very, very bright plaque, it represents a sign of stability. And in fact, he saw that. He found that these plaques were associated with a lower rate of myocardial infarction and acute coronary syndrome. They tended to be the ones that progressed very slowly and generally are not the ones that are associated with ischemia. And then I think what that made us realize is that this continuum of grayscale represents a continuum of risk as evidenced by Alexander's JAMA paper from last year, where he found that this plaque is more dangerous than this plaque, and which is more dangerous than this plaque and so on. And the reason that's important is because it looks like you can influence the natural history of all of that risk. So we had done a study with statin medications, and uh, Dr. Budoff had done a study with icosapen ethyl. It's been repeated with PCSK9 inhibitors, as well as the DASH diet and physical activity. And what all of those good things that we provide for patients do to atherosclerosis is that they transform it. And we found in all of those studies that dark plaques turn brighter over time as a result of getting all of that, um, that beneficial medical therapy and lifestyle. And that's associated with a reduction in, um, in a future major adverse cardiac events. The problem here, I think, is manifold. I put everything on one slide, but I can tell you that there are a number of problems that should be highlighted here. The first is to, for us to use those softwares and try to make these <clears throat> excuse me, these yellow and these orange circles was taking us many, many hours per patient. So it was never going to become a clinical tool. It was always going to be a research tool. And I think the second problem is probably the bigger one, which is if you look at this slide, unless you're an imager, you actually don't care about this slide. It's overwhelming to you. You don't understand what you're looking at, nor should you, because you didn't study imaging science. You're, you know, maybe you're a clinician or maybe you're a patient. So somehow all of this information, even if we could extract it in a more timely fashion, becomes completely opaque to the end users who really need it, the clinicians and the patients. So what we did was we set out to start a company, which we started about four years ago called Clearly, in order to try to solve these problems. And the first problem was how do you do whole heart um, atherosclerosis characterization in a matter of minutes rather than hours? And so what you see here is an FDA cleared software called Clearly Labs. Um, it does whole heart coronary atherosclerosis characterization and quantification, as well as vascular morphology assessment in a matter of minutes rather than hours. Um, we've done a couple of multicenter clinical trials to demonstrate the accuracy of it and have another three ongoing multicenter clinical trials to really validate this technique against expert readers, against a blinded core lab doing QCA, against intravascular ultrasound, against optical coherence tomography, and against near field infrared spectroscopy. And rather than sort of build it for sort of the, the way that things were done, where you have to go down to radiology, use a single user software license, we tried to build this for convenience so that anybody could access this technology just by logging onto the web. So it's a zero footprint web enabled solution. You can just log on to Google Chrome and start interacting with these large imaging data sets uh, with seamless interaction and no lag. And then the turnaround time based upon all of the latest in machine learning that we applied to this is that, um, that we can now do this in a matter of minutes rather than hours, which is great. So now we've solved one problem, that, that time intensive piece of it. The second problem still remains that nobody actually knows what you're looking at here. And so what we need to do is figure out how do you deliver this information to clinicians in a way that they can actually ingest it and use it clinically. 
And so what we did was we created a second software platform called Clearly Cornered, also an FDA cleared um, software. And what you see here is actually a similar patient to the slide before. It's just all of that imaging data was then translated to quantitative data. And that quantitative data was then translated into uh, visualizations that any doctor can sort of ingest in a matter of 10, 12 seconds. So all of the data is curated, whether it's related to the stenosis or atherosclerosis findings or CADRADS, and it's summarized for you as well. When I was at Cornell and we had this great prevention program called Heart Health, where we would use the images to actually educate the patients of what was going on inside of their body. And so we really wanted this to be interactive as well. And so you can see, like, if I can see this concerning area of red here, I can click this and I can say, Mrs. Smith, like, this area really has a lot of plaque. It has a severe uh, narrowing. This is the exact quantitative measurements of those narrowings. And in this box here, where at least when we did the, the clinical studies when I was at Cornell, were associated with um, you know, important clinical features related to the total atheroma volume, um, the low density non-calcified plaque, um, positive arterial remodeling. And rather than making somebody go and try to find the images and upload them to a workstation, um, they're just laid out on the web for you. You can spin around in 360 degrees and you can use this tracker tool to really interrogate every millimeter of the artery and its branches so that you can visualize it for the patient in a way that they can understand as well. You can do this visualization on the segment level, on the vessel level, and on the territory level as well. And then what we recognize is that while many are basic users, some more advanced users need different types of information. And so you can see all of these tabs where you can go deeper and deeper into the software so that it tries to touch every single stakeholder of the care pathway. And in this case, maybe it's an interventional cardiologist who wants to understand lesion lengths, stenosis severity, reference diameter ranges to do a little bit of uh, planning. And you can see that we can get measures of atherosclerosis, of CADRAD score in depth, for researchers, the quantitative output, and then um, a full text report is generated in accordance with the Society of Cardiovascular CT guidelines. Now, here's the issue is that the doctors um, have given us a lot of warm feedback on these two software platforms, but the patients hated it. They said, look, you still give me this report that I don't understand. And so what we do is, is we generate a, a 25 page book that's associated with any patient's analysis to really take these very complex concepts related to coronary pathophysiology and then boil them down into a way that any non-medical layperson can understand. So the first thing is really to help them understand what is coronary artery disease, because 99% of the patients think that the blockage is the problem, but it's not. It's the plaque that causes the blockage that is the problem. And so we help them understand heart attack risk as it relates to atherosclerosis, stenosis, and ischemia. And then we also help them understand how this analysis may help decipher some of that uh, information for them and then show them their actual images using color metric schemes to emphasize um, the findings, whether it's red, yellow, or blue. And then embedded within the book are the 15 questions that were most commonly asked to us when we were taking care of patients in the office, where we tried to translate that into illustrations and writing at a seventh grade reading level in order so that any but non-medical layperson could really understand it and be empowered by the data that we have extracted from that imaging analysis and disease phenotype. The fourth step <laughs> was something that sort of we recalled back at when we were practicing at Cornell. And we utilized these images to do quantitative disease burden and tracking disease progression in order to figure out how intense our medical therapy should be. Now, obviously, as a company, we're not regulated to do that, and we do not espouse any treatment algorithms based upon our current technology. Technology. But since I, I left Cornell, just in the last four years, there's been the introduction of at least 10 different classes of medications now that we can utilize for prevention um, approaches. And what we have done is we've worked with the ACC Innovation Program Working Group, who has developed a series of treatment pathways for patients with lipid disorders, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and tobacco use, where in these uh, pathways, um, the baseline decision of how intense therapy ought to be is simply based on how much disease somebody has. And the decision of whether or not to keep that therapy the same or to intensify therapy is based on whether or not the patient's disease is progressing or not. And so that sort of leads us to the last step of this whole analysis, which is how do you track success and or failure of your therapies in order to guide this in a, a judicious way? And that comes back to an investigational software that we have right now called Clearly Compare. And now that we understand different changes as it relates to all of the pathophysiology that Dr. Bax spoke about, we can now track this on a patient level, on a vessel level on a um, lesion level to understand what is happening in the coronary arteries over the course of time. 
So, so that's essentially what we're trying to do clearly. We're trying to address some of the challenges that we identified when we were doing research and taking care of patients in the office and have developed um, an AI-enabled solution that enables whole heart atherosclerosis characterization in a matter of minutes, but with a very heavy emphasis on translating all of that imaging science into education that clinic clinicians can use, as well as to improve health literacy for the patients um, using implementation science. With our partnership with the ACC, we see the ACC Innovations Working Group is really developing very novel leading edge uh, treatment pathways uh, to treat atherosclerosis rather than surrogate markers of, of coronary artery disease. And then we, can, we hope to be able to track that quantitatively over the course of time to ensure success, really to get into a new era of doing preventive cardiology through precision prevention by measuring actual disease and disease characteristics. Together now with a group of uh, you know, uh, investigators across the globe, we're now currently performing another large scale study to really better understand cardiovascular pathophysiology um, with this foundation and trying to expand upon that. Yep. Because I think that's what science does, right? You, you have a question, you answer it, and it just begets more questions. It doesn't, you never come to the final fruition. You just keep exploring out of curiosity. Yeah, and, and if you believe initially that you're going to solve something that's absolutely never going to happen it's always bringing more questions yeah exactly it and then the questions anything. i think the, the one thing I, I think we can emphasize is that all the questions come from the patient right like the with it's always starts with an observation from a single individual patient and then absolutely. it opens up this entire body of research where it fundamentally changes our our perspectives on on how we should diagnose treat prognosticate um, and track disease over time.